Some uh, all right, good evening, church. Sorry for that um, um, snafu there for a moment, but we're back online. Um, let me go ahead and open up with a word of prayer for tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for all that you are doing, the things that we see as well as the things that we do not see. We thank you for the saints who are here tonight as well as those who are on their way. We pray for those in Awana that you are helping to um, bring them there safely as, as well as the kids. May that be a blessing to them. I know Mike Ramirez is teaching tonight over there, so bless him. Help him to just be faithful and clear in how he is teaching the children. And we pray that you be glorified both there as well as here. And we give you thanks for all these opportunities we have to come and worship you and to praise you and to learn more about all that you would have us learn from men who are gifted to teach. And Father, we give thanks and pray these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, Rick. Welcome to our midweek service. We'll take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 78, Blessed Redeem Redeemer. Hymn number 78. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them. From endless love, blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding. Dying for me. Father, forgive them. Thus he did pray. He, while his life blood flowed fast away, praying for sinners while in such woe, no one but Jesus ever loved so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find end? Through years unnumbered on heaven's shore, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unhealing, dying for me. It's good singing tonight by all of you. <laughs> okay, 79, when we see Christ. Of times a day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain. To murmur and despair, 
But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Sometimes the sky looks dark, with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problem, just go to him in prayer. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glance of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Life's day will soon be o'er, all storm forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of hell, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Thank you, Brother Jerry. All right, well, I'm going to start tonight with a bit of a <clears throat> correction or an adjustment. Uh, I gave you a couple weeks ago this chart on historical eras, and I forgot to note on there that I added some stuff that wasn't on the website, and the, the bottom uh, section there, the last row dealing with postmodernism, uh, I think I added the last three things, and I forgot to put those in brackets. You may remember on the, the handout on uh, types of, of uh, 
You might remember on the uh, handout on types of apologetics, I noted that the encyclopedia where I got that information didn't cover everything, and so where they left stuff out, I kind of added in, and I put that in brackets. I forgot to do that on this chart. <laughs> so I think the last three uh, items there were my thoughts. Get up to uh, where we are here. <clears throat> so last week we started our discussion of critical thinking. We got a little bit into it, just introductory stuff. Um, critical thinking is essential to effective and clear apologetic communication, and we're going to see why. Technically, critical thinking applies to everything in life. You can't survive without it. Um, but specifically, it's going to, be, going to be helpful in uh, doing apologetics. We talked a little bit about the ways that word critical is used. Uh, some people see it as a negative thing, like a, a critical person is someone who's always looking at the, the bad stuff, always complaining or whatever. Uh, it can also mean essential or important or vital as in the critical care unit in the hospital. But it, for our purposes, it doesn't mean that. There's another meaning which we'll get to as we go along here. So we want to start with some definitions of uh, critical thinking. <clears throat> I put together five definitions from different sources. They all say pretty much the same thing, but they say it in different ways. And seeing it from different perspectives will give you a broader understanding of what critical thinking is all about. The, uh, the words in red here are, are related to the nature of critical thinking. <clears throat> so those are the, the words we need to focus on. The uh, words that are kind of a pale blue there and are underlined, uh, they're that way because they are links to articles on those issues. But they don't relate to the nature of critical thinking. Okay, so we're looking primarily on the red, or at the red uh, words there. And unfortunately, my tablet isn't working tonight. I don't know why it just died. <laughs> So I'm going to have to read this somehow. I can't see that screen in the back. <clears throat> so I'll have to turn it around and read it off of this. Okay. So critical thinking is purposeful and reflective judgment about what to believe or do in response to um, observation, experience, verbal or written expressions, or arguments. So purposeful and reflective. You got to, you know, you know what you're doing. You're doing it for a reason, and it's a judgment. Uh, critical thinking might involve determining the meaning and significance of what is observed or expressed, or concerning a given inference or argument, determining whether there is adequate justification to accept the conclusion as true. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <clears throat> You get the, the idea from that, that critical thinking is in-depth observation about everything you see around you. In this case, we're dealing primarily with a statement. And in order to know whether or not you can trust it, you need to go through this critical thinking process and consider all of these things. Uh, another definition. Critical thinking calls for a persistent effort to examine any belief or supposed form of knowledge in the light of the evidence that supports it and the further conclusions to which it tends. So we have another word added there, persistent. It's an ongoing thing. Uh, and you're examining evidence again and, and seeing whether or not it leads to the conclusion. The conclusion is basically what somebody wants you to believe. And you have to evaluate whether the evidence they give really does support that conclusion that they want you to believe. 
So in essence, you don't want to take things at face value. You can get in trouble doing that. Uh, another definition. <clears throat> Critical thinking is a persistent effort to examine evidence that supports any belief, solution, or conclusion prior to its acceptance. It's the ability to think clearly, to analyze, and to reason logically. So again, you're dealing with a careful consideration of things uh, before you decide to accept or believe whatever it is the person wants you to believe. <clears throat> uh, another definition. Oh, critical thinking is one of the most important skills for college work and beyond. It seeks the meaning beneath the surface of a statement, poem, editorial, picture, advertisement, or other text. Using analysis, the critical thinker separates the text into its elements in order to see meanings relations and assumptions that might otherwise remain buried. In essence, you're reading between the lines. Instead of just looking at what the person says, you've got to go back and look at what he implies. <clears throat> Again, you're not taking things at face value. You're, you're trying to understand what's going on in the speaker's mind, trying to figure out why he says what he says, why he thinks that you ought to believe what he's telling you to believe. Um, Is it not? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. So the last uh, definition for critical thinking. Critical thinking is the identification and evaluation of evidence to guide decision making. A critical thinker uses broad, in-depth analysis of evidence to make decisions and communicate his or her beliefs clearly and accurately. You can see how this would apply to apologetics, because you are trying to communicate your defense of the faith. So you want to be sure that uh, you put together your reasons, your evidence, in a way that is going to be clear to the person you're talking to. So again, we're talking about analysis, evaluation of evidence. All of that is part of critical thinking. Um, most uh, definitions of critical thinking relate to argumentation, but it goes beyond that. As I said a minute ago, critical thinking is something we need every day. It's, it's an essential part of life, which brings up a point. You already do critical thinking. You may not know it, but you, everybody has to do it or you can't live. <laughs> Anytime you make a decision, you practice critical thinking. So much of what we're going to talk about when we talk about critical thinking and get into logical fallacies is sort of common sense. You already understand these things. We're just kind of putting definitions to them. I think that's kind of what education is mostly about. You go to school not to learn something new, but to put definitions to what you already know. We shall see. So I have a practical definition of critical, critical thinking, but specifically here dealing with the word critical. It comes from Greek, and I'm, we're going to talk about several uh, Cognates. A cognate is a word that's related to other words that are related to other words that relate to the same thing. You get into your parts of speech, the nouns, the adjectives, the verbs. They all come from the same root, so they're all cognates of that root word. So first of all, we have an adjective, kritikos, 
Kritikos, that's a transliteration of the word from Greek. This is the way it would sound in Greek, but this is spelled in English. That's a transliteration. So this adjective means that you're able to discern. So a person who is really good at noticing differences, you would call him Kritikos. <laughs> He's good at doing that. We have another adjective form, kritos, a little shorter, but that means separated or chosen. It's kind of passive. The first one is active. Kritikos is something you do, you're able to discern. Kritos describes something that has been discerned. It has been chosen, it has been separated. <clears throat> the infinitive is krenain, that means to separate or to choose something. And we have the verb krino, which means to judge, to decide, or to make a distinction between things. And the next three words are not as related to what we're going to talk about, but they are cognate, so I put them in there anyway. Uh, we have a, a noun, kretes, which means a judge. So. Kritikos, kritos, krenain, krites is a judge, the one who makes the decision. And krisis is a separating or a, a decision, a judgment, another noun. And then the final noun, krima, krima, which means a judgment, usually in reference to evidence. This is like the decision or the verdict in a trial. It's also used for God's judgment of mankind because the evidence shows <laughs> it's, it's due. So these are all what this word critical is about. It has to do basically with discerning things, making a decision, making a distinction, separating things. That requires careful thinking. And you have to look at all the evidence that you have in order to make that distinction. <clears throat> so a, def a practical definition then of critical thinking is to think carefully so as to make an appropriate decision. So in this case, the word critical has to do with being careful, not with being essential or important or negative, but it means to be careful. It's careful thinking. So to think carefully so as to make an appropriate decision. When you're dealing with apologetics, this is what you're going to need to do in order to sort through the evidence and put your ideas together and present them in a way that's going to be meaningful to the person you're talking to. Uh, the nature of critical thinking. A couple of aspects of this. Uh, the ability to think critically involves three things. First of all, an attitude of being disposed to consider in a thoughtful way uh, uh, the problems and subjects that come within the range of one's experiences. In essence, you have to be willing to do it. Disposed to consider. Before, and I guess this is obvious, before you can, can practice critical thinking, you have to be willing to do it. This is like one of those, duh, how else are you going to do it if you don't want to? Reminds me, this has nothing to do with this, it's just something that I observed the other day. Um, I heard a, a stock market analyst commenting on recent market activity. And he said, volatility was all over the place. I mean, <laughs> that's the nature of volatility. It could be all over the place. <clears throat> so the first element for critical thinking is you have to be willing to do it. Uh, secondly, you have to have a knowledge of the methods of logical thinking and reasoning, logical inquiry and reasoning. Uh, basically, that means you have to know how to do it. <laughs> 
So you have to be willing to do it. You have to know how to do it. And thirdly, uh, you have to have some skill in applying those methods. So you have to be willing to exercise critical thinking. You have to know how to do it. And then finally, you have to be able to do it. You have to have the skill. And you will develop the skill for critical thinking the more you practice. We've talked about this before. The more you think in these terms, the more you train your brain to think this way. And we're getting, going to get into some of the aspects of critical thinking, and you're going to think, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a lot. But the more you work at it, the more your brain just automatically does that. And so it, it becomes second nature. There is a learning curve. You know, it takes time, but persistence pays off. And this is from this guy, uh, Glasser. Another aspect of the nature of critical thinking from the same source, critical thinking can occur whenever one judges, decides, read it. Uh, judges decides or solves a problem in general whenever one must figure out what to believe or what to do and do so in a reasonable and reflective way. That's kind of when critical thinking happens. And as I said, we do this all the time. When you decide what you want to eat for breakfast, assuming you eat breakfast, you should, it's the most important meal of the day. <laughs> You exercise critical thinking. You know, the first thing you do is open the cupboard and see what's available. You know, what choices do I have? And then you think, well, how hungry am I? That's going to help you decide what. And then how long is this going to have to keep me full until I eat again? That's going to be another thing to consider in making your choice. And you go through all of those things, and finally you decide what you want to eat. Well, that's critical thinking. We do it all the time. Uh, critical thinking employs not only logic, either formal or much more often informal, but broad intellectual criteria such as clarity, credibility, accuracy, precision, relevance, depth, breadth, significance. So again, all of those things are things you consider as you're doing critical thinking. <clears throat> That's all involved in the decision-making process. So that's what critical thinking basically is all about. What is the focus of critical thinking? Well, all critical thinking issues can be reduced to two questions. Now, there are many questions to ask, and we will talk about those when we get to techniques. But these are two essential questions. And I came up with these questions kind of by accident, long before I even started looking into critical thinking. Um, I remember back as 1988 or 89, I was visiting my brother. He's living in Denver at the time. And uh, his youngest daughter was like six or seven years old. Very sharp kid. I mean, he could almost have conversations with her even when she was that. Now she's in her early 30s, has a PhD in music therapy, and is helping the University of Arizona put together their music therapy program. Always was sharp. And um, I'd be talking to her, and she would make a statement, and I would ask her the first question, and she would answer with a very definite yes. And I'd ask her the second question, and she kind of looked at me like, what planet are you from? She didn't understand the question because her mind hadn't developed to the point where she could answer that kind of question. It's a critical thinking question. Most people don't start thinking at that level until they get to college. So these two questions kind of summarize the essence of critical thinking. These questions also do you some uh, favor. They benefit you in a... In a uh, an encounter, an apologetics encounter. They help to clarify things for you, to help you understand what the other person is thinking and, and how he's presenting the evidence or you know, whether or not the evidence is valid. It also takes the pressure off of you because you switch 
He's got to explain his point. You don't have to explain yours. So when someone comes up with a statement, for example, if someone says, well, I can't believe the Bible because it's full of contradictions. Well, the first question you ask if somebody comes up with, I'm just using that as an example, could be any kind of objection. The first question is, are you sure? Like, how do you know the Bible's full of contradictions? Asking a question like that may make the person stop and think. <laughs> Am I really sure about this? Most often I found that people who raise that objection don't really know what a contradiction is. They've heard somebody else say this, and they're merely repeating what they've heard. They haven't read the Bible or anything like that. So are you sure? And along with that question, you might ask, how do you define a contradiction? Because you want to know if they know what they're talking about. But are you sure? And once they say yes, assuming they do, and most often they will, you ask the second question, how do you know? What evidence do you have to prove that there are contradictions in the Bible? Give me an example of a contradiction. Most of the time, the people who say there are contradictions in the Bible refer to the variations in the gospel accounts. They'll say, well, this gospel writer says that when the women went to the tomb on that Sunday morning, there were two angels there. This other gospel writer says there was one. That's a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction. That's a variation in the account. A contradiction would be one writer says there are two angels there, and another one says there were no angels there. That's a contradiction. But if you have two angels in one account and only one mentioned in the other account, mentioning one doesn't mean there weren't two. It just focuses on the one who did the talking. So that's not a contradiction, it's a variation in the accounts. And you should expect variations like that, because the gospel writers are talking about the same incidents, but they're talking about them from their own point of view. And they have different purposes. So that's going to influence what details they choose to record. So information like that it can help the person understand that what he thinks is a contradiction is not a contradiction. So his argument is out the window because he's not talking, you know, it's, you're talking across purposes. <clears throat> so these two questions then are essential to critical thinking. When someone brings up an accusation or, or a complaint or an objection, ask these two questions. Again, this gets the focus on them. They have to explain their point. You don't have to defend your point. They have to explain their and this also, as I said, these questions also can wake up their minds to think, well, maybe my position isn't as strong as I thought it was. Yeah, and there's going to be some instances where for you to be able to answer um, any contradictions or what they perceive as contradictions, it's going to require some theological understanding on your side as well. So, for instance, in the Old Testament, when David uh, made a census um, towards the end of his life, on one account, it says Satan caused him to make the census. And another account, it says the Lord caused him to do the census. And um, it was sinful, and David ended up being judged for that. But why does one account say Satan, and the other one says Lord? Looks like a contradiction, unless theologically you understand that Satan can't do anything without the um, allowance of God to allow him to do that. So it's kind of like when you think about the beginning of the book of Job. Job wanted to afflict, I'm sorry, Satan wanted to afflict Job. But he couldn't do it unless Satan gave him permission. And essentially, that's what happened with David. So that's one of those cases where you need to have some theological understanding to be able to address that kind of apparent or perceived contradiction. Right. So that's kind of like um, getting your ammunition ready. <laughs> Studying for apologetics is a process. You know, and it's an ongoing process. So, a profile of a critical thinker. If you want to know whether or not you're a critical thinker, um, these are things a critical thinker does. So, assuming that critical thinking is reasonable 
reflective thinking focused on deciding what to believe or do, and it is, um, a critical thinker has these characteristics. Is open-minded and mindful of alternatives. You want to see things from a, a variety of perspectives. This helps you to understand anyone who comes up with an objection. You can say, oh yeah, I've heard that. Secondly, tries to be well informed. This is kind of like an extension of, of number one. The reason you are open-minded in considering alternative uh, possibilities is that you, you are being well informed. You're aware of what the opposition arguments are. You're aware of how to answer those arguments. And again, that takes some study. That takes some focus, some concentration. But you want to be well informed. Uh, thirdly, judge as well the credibility of sources. You have to know whether your opponent's sources, where he gets his arguments, is worth it. Are they valid sources? And you want to be sure that your sources are valid as well. You don't want to have weak arguments. <clears throat> so you have to know how to evaluate sources. You know, if you, if the guy comes up with an objection and you say, well, where did you get that? He says, well, I read it on a cereal box. <laughs> you can say, well, that's probably not a very good source. <laughs> yeah, unless it's Cheerios. <laughs> uh, next, he identifies, um, can't read it. conclusions, reasons, and assumptions. So when your opponent gives his argument, he, you have to understand, you have to be able to identify his conclusion. That's what he wants you to believe. You have to be able to pick out the reasons he gives, and you have to be able to identify his assumptions. Assumptions are things that someone believes are true, but are not necessarily stated. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But you have to realize, well, you're assuming that this is true when you say this. So is that assumption valid? Yeah, and, and the majority of time, I would say there are mistaken assumptions that are being made but not stated. Right. So when you hear them make their argument, think in terms of what assumptions are they making that leads them to that argument, because they rarely say it themselves. But this is the one area that I normally catch people, I'm saying, and I'll, I'll respond back with, well, what you're saying is based upon a mistaken assumption, and I'll go back and address that assumption. Right. Um, everybody has assumptions. We all make assumptions. You have to be sure that your assumptions are based on evidence. Um, there are, in every argument, there are un called underlying assumptions. These are things that have to be true in order for the argument to be true. But if the assumption is off, then the argument isn't true. Yeah, it's kind of like if someone were to ask me, have you stopped, have you stopped um, beating your kids, yeah. right? Um, well, it's a yes or no answer, right? It seems like a simple question. It's a yes or no answer. But if you answer yes or no, you're actually acknowledging a presumption that you beat your kids in the first place. And so you want to go, wait a second, that presumes something that's actually not true. Right. So you have to be able to identify those things, and then you have to be able to evaluate them. Is the conclusion that the person gives you, what he wants you to believe, is that really valid? Does it come from the evidence? Does the evidence actually support that conclusion? Are those assumptions that he's making valid? Are they true? So you have to be able to identify the parts of his argument, and then you have to be able to evaluate the parts of his argument. And then another characteristic, a uh, critical thinker can well devise and defend a reasonable position. This is what you're doing when you're defending your faith. You want to have an argument that supports your defense. It has to be reasonable. Reasonable simply means it makes sense. It matches reality as we know it. So. In order to be a good critical thinker, you've got to be able to put together a reasonable argument. 
Um, then this, the seventh one there asks appropriate clarifying questions. We talked about the two essential questions. Are you sure and how do you know? There are others to ask, but they clarify. Instead of, instead of charging in to a, a conflict in, a, in an apologetic encounter, ask questions, clarify. What do you mean by that? And where did you get that idea? Uh, you want to know what your reader, or what your reader, what your opponent, and again, as I said before, I'm using the word opponent, but I don't mean to set up a conflict. Okay, it's just the person you're talking to. You want to know what he thinks and why he thinks that. So ask those questions to clarify the issue. You want to be sure you're on the same page. And then formulates plausible hypotheses and plans experiments well. This, I'm not sure, deals exactly with apologetics, but we can make it apply. A hypothesis is basically an, I, I, an idea, a concept. Hasn't been tested, hasn't been verified. But in this case, it is plausible. Plausible means believable. It could happen. And then we're not doing experiments here, but you are defending. You are coming up with evidence to back up your point. So we could make this one apply. Your, your hypothesis is your defense. It's got to be believable. And um, you have to show by the evidence why it's believable. And then defines terms in a way that is appropriate for the context. This is extremely important. We were talking last week about uh, postmodernism and deconstructionism, where people say words don't have objective meaning. If that's true, then conversation is impossible. So you have to define your terms. You have to be sure that both of you are on the same page. Otherwise, you're talking about different things. Uh, I think of the word science. If you're talking to an evolutionist, and you come up with a perfectly logical conclusion that based on the evidence we see around us, there has to be a creator. There has to be a god out there, someone who put all this together. But evolutionists will probably say that's not a scientific answer. And you're saying, well, it is too, because it's evidence. <laughs> well, there are two definitions of science floating around out there, and you have to be sure you're talking about the same kind of science. Most of us, when we hear the word science, we think of the so-called scientific method, where you look at the evidence, you make some comparisons, you do some tests, and you come up with a conclusion based on all that. It's objective, observation, and evaluation, and conclusion. Evolutionists believe in what's called naturalism, which is actually a philosophy and not science. And that says that nothing but the physical, work, the physical universe exists. There's nothing outside of it. So any answer has to come from nature. It has to be a naturalistic explanation. You can't have a divine explanation. If it comes from nature, it's science. If it comes from theology, it's not science, even though the theology might be based on or supported by evidence. So if someone mentions science, you've got to be sure you're talking about the same kind of science. So ask those questions, define those terms. And the first definition of science is the true definition. Yeah. Uh, because if they're including philosophy, it's no longer science. Or if they're trusting, say, the, sci the, the consensus of a scientific community, that also is not science. Because right. a scientific consensus means it's not, um, it's not Factual. It's basically people weighing in with their opinions on, on what that is. Yeah, and even yeah, and even if you've got a one hundred percent consensus, it's still not solid uh, solid proof. Right. So the consensus is irrelevant. <laughs> That's just saying all these people agree. Well, so maybe they're all wrong. Right. Um, and, yeah. and and when when we consider the true definition <clears throat> of science, realize that science is not meant to validate or invalidate God. Mm -hmm. That's not the boundaries of science. It's not there for that. It, it, it neither makes a statement about a creator, the absence or a presence of a creator, 
but its boundaries actually limits it from being able to look at anything that's, that's supernatural, that, that's divine in nature. Right. Just to finish that thought, um, this isn't our point, but to finish the thought, uh, they say the scientists, quote unquote scientists, say that science has proved that God does not exist. Well, science can't do that. Right. Science is limited to the physical. And their, their argument is science is limited to the physical and it can't detect anything outside the physical, therefore nothing outside the physical exists. That's a false argument. Science was designed to measure the physical universe. That's all it can do. It was never intended to detect anything outside of nature. To say that it does is, is simply, well, what word shall I use? <laughs> Less than wise. Um, I, I heard a good illustration of this. If someone wants to say that, you know, if someone wants to say science proves that God doesn't exist because it can't detect any God out there, then hand them a book and a ruler and say to them, okay, using this ruler, the way rulers are intended to be used, tell me how much this book weighs. Hmm. They're going to say, well, you can't measure weight with a ruler. Hmm. Well, duh, you can't measure God with science. A ruler was designed for certain functions. Science was designed for certain functions. It cannot detect anything outside those functions. So they say, well, we can't detect the weight with a ruler. Then you can say, well, then I guess the book doesn't have any weight. If the ruler can't detect it, then it can't be there. It's the same way as saying uh, science can't detect God, therefore God doesn't exist. You're talking about two different things. So define terms. Okay. This also is very important in dealing with cults because they have their own definitions of terms that we use all the time, but we define them differently. Uh, let's see, the critical thinker also um, draws conclusions when um, warranted, but with caution. This kind of goes back to the first one. The first one talked about being open-minded and considering alternative explanations. These two kind of go together. The problem with the first one is being open-minded is okay and considering alternatives is okay, but you have to come to a conclusion eventually. You have to make a decision. You can't keep thinking about things the rest of your life. Some people are so open-minded that their brains fall out. You've got to think, and you've got to come to a conclusion. So this one says you do come to a conclusion when warranted. That means you have studied the evidence, you've studied the facts, you've done the critical thinking, and so you have decided that this conclusion is true. Okay, so, can I add to that? Being <laughs> open-minded, we want to be open-minded with regards to alternative possibilities to explaining things, but there's a limit to that, too, in the sense that we all operate out of a certain worldview. Everyone operates out of, out, of, out of a certain worldview that they assume there are certain principles and truths that are, that are irrefutable. And so that's the case with us. Like, for instance, we know that the Bible is the Word of God. We know that God exists. We're open-minded, but don't be open-minded to the point where you think that God might not exist, right? So, um, so we we're, realize that there's limitations to everyone with regards to what they're open-minded about. Yeah, you want to be open-minded to the details, to the evidence, to the, to the statements, but that doesn't mean you have to believe it all. <laughs> you have to do the critical thinking. You know, that's how you come to your conclusions. And then finally, the critical thinker integrates all of these things, all of these ten things, uh, any time there needs to be a decision. And you're thinking, wow, that's a lot. And it is. But as I mentioned, the more you do this, the more your brain is trained to think this way. And so it does it automatically after a while. And it's kind of surprising. You, somebody says something, and all of a sudden, your, your brain just starts going through this list. And you say, 
like in two seconds, you say, oh, but that doesn't work because <laughs> of this, this, this. <clears throat> but you've got to train your brain to do that. So those are the uh, characteristics of a critical thinker. And that comes from uh, this guy, the uh, Cornell Critical Thinking Tests. So how do we apply this? Well, there are phases of learning content. The content that we're talking about in this case is opposition arguments and your defense. Okay, so you're learning what the other pe people say and how they defend their position, and you're learning the evidence that you can present to defend your position. So first of all, there's internalization. You visualize all of that stuff that you're trying to learn. You personalize it. You make it real in yourself. And then you use it. Using it kind of cements it. Once you start practicing it, then it becomes even clearer. So two, two parts of learning content, any kind of content really, we're in, in apologetics we're talking about the arguments for and against and the reasons and all of that stuff. You have to think about it and understand it, and then you have to use it. And, this, and again, the using it helps to make it clearer. So we summarize all this. Uh, critical thinking is uh, essential to argumentation and so to apologetics. In order to present evidence to defend the various aspects of Christianity, one must understand the opposition arguments, their weaknesses, the facts that refute those arguments, and how to present those facts effectively. All of this requires analytical thinking and the use of critical thinking skills. And again, that's a lot. But the more you do it, the easier it is, the more natural it becomes. <clears throat> and um, I think we're going to have to end it there. We're almost out of time. Because next is getting into what those critical thinking skills are. And we've got only a couple minutes left, and it's going to take longer than that. So we'll end it there for tonight. Any questions or comments, observations? <laughs> well, you, you, that's true. <laughs> Being dogmatic can be understood in two ways. You know from a biblical point of view that your faith is true and is real. So in your own mind, you are dogmatic, thinking this is the truth. But you don't have to be dogmatic when you're talking to somebody else. That's the big difference. Okay, You want to present your, your defense in a reasonable way, with the evidence, with the facts. Let the person know the thought process. You know, I thought through this. I've looked at all these facts, and that has led me to believe this. But you don't want to hit them over the head and say, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't care what you say. Yeah, That doesn't work. Okay. So yeah, you can be dogmatic in the sense that you're confident in the truth of your faith, but you don't want to be dogmatic in the presentation. Anything else? Okay, well, let's close in prayer. Again, Father, thank you for the opportunity to review the, the things that are necessary for critical thinking so that we can present a defense of our faith in a more effective way. In Jesus' name.